Driving a taxi in New York City in the mid-1980s, things were rough. The crack cocaine epidemic was at its peak. The AIDS epidemic was at its peak. Our exalted leader in Washington, D.C., Ronald Reagan, did nothing about AIDS. He did nothing internationally except embarrass people who were really thinking about issues. When I traveled in Europe in the summer of 1985, I didn't know what to tell people who asked how it could be possible we had such leadership in Washington, such a cosmetically attractive, intellectually vacuous president. It was impossible to explain. Driving the streets of New York Things were quite dangerous. There were a lot of cab drivers killed year to year. Statistically, cab driving was shown to be the most dangerous trade in New York. It was, during those years, more dangerous than being a policeman, a firefighter, a construction worker 40 stories above the ground. The fleet where I worked had a man killed, shot to death. There were in one year something like 35 drivers, if you were to count gypsy drivers in the outlying boroughs, killed in one year. But what was hardest for me to take was the greed of many of the people we drove around in our yellow taxis. I had a friend from down the street from where I'd grown up in Ithaca, New York, who had been a good guy. He'd seemed an admirable character. He was teaching English in high school, which was a heroic line of work to be in, as far as I was concerned. It was right up there with nursing as one of the major things to help society. But then he went off the rails, his friend. He ditched his wife, married his best friend's wife, who had ditched her husband, and she seemed to infect him with the same spirit of greed that Nancy Reagan had infected her dear Ronnie with when she met him in Hollywood, whenever that was, and turned him from a Democrat into an arch right-wing reactionary Republican. So this friend of mine from Ithaca, when he went off the rails and stopped teaching English, he went to law school, he became a corporate lawyer in New York, he did the greediest thing he could think of doing for those days. And he started making money like crazy. That's all he was interested in. Became a diehard Republican. When I asked him how his law firm was in comparison to his brother's law firm, his brother who worked in a law firm that was known for being interested in representing the arts, museums, artists. When I asked him to compare his firm with his brother's firm, he said, oh, our firm is way better. We make way more money than they do. He said it with half a smile, but I could tell he meant it. They were better because they made more money. And a lot of these types I picked up on Wall Street in New York, brokers, lawyers, deal makers, they had that same wide vein of greed running very near the surface of their personalities. So one night, one year in the mid to late 80s, December was snowing out, at least midnight, I picked up a man who was working down near the World Trade Towers. He had just gotten out of a Christmas party, he told me. He was sloshed, and he had to get up to Grand Central in time to catch the last train back to Westport, Connecticut. Westport being one of the wealthier suburbs 
He had to catch the 119 or whatever it was. I said, I'll get you there in time. Don't worry. The snow won't slow us down. And we headed uptown toward Grand Central. Along the way, I thought I'd make conversation, and I said in a joking tone to him, wouldn't you really rather travel in the comfort of a yellow taxi than in a train to Westport? And that caught his interest. He didn't reject such a ridiculous idea out of hand. Here we were in a yellow taxi. It smelled terrible. We were bouncing with great juddering noises over potholes. A train would be so much more restful. But after a pause, he said, well, what would that cost me? And I said, oh, I'll just look in my little book. It'll tell me. I pulled out my official New York taxi driver's guide. And I found the fare to Westport, Connecticut, because anything out of town, anything out of the five boroughs of New York, could either be negotiated by the driver with the customer or looked up in the official book. To be strictly legal, you had to look up the fare in the book and quote it back to the customer. San Francisco, California was listed in the book. Las Vegas, thousands and thousands of dollars the fare might be, but it was conceivable. Someone at my fleet had driven someone to Atlantic City and had made $300 on that trip. These were the sorts of fares we all dreamed of, and here I was kind of daring this customer in the back seat to take me up on one of these fantasy operations. So I found Westport in the book, and I said, the official rate is that would put you back $118. My customer in the back seat thought about this for a minute, and then he said, you got it, in his drunken tones. Yeah, let's go. 118 you got a deal. I said, well, we're not quite done negotiating yet. Do you have enough cash to cover this? It has to be cash. This was the 1980s. Cab drivers didn't accept credit cards in the 1980s. Everything was done with cash. He said, no, I don't have that much cash, but uh, I don't know. We could work out something, couldn't we? Uh, let's see. And I said, well, do you have a money machine card? That was something new at this period in the 80s, an ATM card, automatic teller. He said, yeah, I got a money machine card, but uh, where the hell are we going to stop and get cash? I said, is there one near your home? He said, no, we'd have to drive to Norwalk. That would waste even more time. I'd be better off taking the train than doing that. But I like the idea of going with you. You seem like an okay guy. Let's see. When you get me home, I can go inside and get my checkbook. I'll write you a check. And I said, oh, that sounds kind of borderline to me. For one thing, it involves a lot of trust. Lots of people bounce checks. I don't know about on Wall Street, but people I know bounce a lot of checks. And he said, well, I tell you what, I'll pay you $150 if you'll take my check. And I said, oh, that's a big tip, isn't it? 150 on 180. All right, you got a deal. So I drove him to Westport. It took us maybe 45 minutes to get there. I had assumed that this super drunken guy would probably fall asleep after dictating me a address that I had written down. I'd been through all sorts of nightmares trying to drive home people who'd collapsed so thoroughly they'd fallen asleep and I'd been unable to wake them up that I wasn't looking forward to that. But this guy did not fall asleep. He was perky. He was bright and bouncy there in the back seat of the cab. He wanted to tell me all about his sailboat. That was what made him happiest. Money made him happy. But what made him happiest in life was going out on the ocean in his big sailboat. He kept it moored right there in Westport. He had pictures of it, he said, that he'd show me. They were inside his house in Westport. When we got there, I said, do you see the water from your house? Ah, oh, sure, I see it. I got, a, I got a nice house. It's in a good neighborhood in Westport. I said, can you dock your boat right there in your backyard? Do you have a big pier and you can? No, I said, I got to go to the marina. I'm not in that class. Now, I don't have a palatial estate, but I've got a big house. Wife, kids, they go to the best schools. My wife is good looking. 
I got all the all the American accessories. Don't worry about that. But mostly I got this sailboat. That's what makes me happiest. Ronald Reagan would have loved this guy. He was not what you'd call a progressive. He most likely had never voted socialist in his life. Nor had I, come to think of it. My father had, but that is another story. Norman Thomas, way back when, in the 30s. I didn't know about that yet, though, in terms of my father. I would learn that later. My father was a deeply good man. This guy in the back seat was superficial and a schemer and a money guy. I, in the front seat, was a schemer in my own way, not a money guy. I would have described myself as a progressive, but I'd never voted socialist. So I drove this guy to Westport. It was fine. We didn't talk about things that mattered to me. We didn't talk about Raymond Cano or Flan O'Brien or any of the people who mattered to me in life. He didn't ask me what I did on the side when I wasn't driving a taxi. He didn't know if I'd ever sailed a boat in my life. He was interested in telling me about his big sailboat that had such and such kind of sails and had a huge high mast and teak flooring on the deck, all that kind of stuff. I said, does your wife like to sail? No, she doesn't care for it much. These kids of yours, they like to sail? No, not really. They'd rather be at home watching TV. Anyone else? Who do you sail with? Well, I've got an uncle who likes to sail. He goes out with me. Does he live in Westport? Oh, he lives in Danbury. He said it in such a way that I knew his uncle wasn't rich the way he was. Conceivably, his uncle hadn't even voted for Ronald Reagan, the way this guy must have. But I drove him. He was friendly enough with me. We get into my house, he said. I'll give you a drink and I'll get myself one too and I'll make out that check for 150. Fine, says I. Let's do that. Except I don't think I'll have a drink. You won't. He sounded betrayed at the idea that I wouldn't drink with him. I said, no, I really can't. I'm on the job. I never drink on the job, which wasn't entirely true either. I would usually stop and have a drink before I took my car into the fleet headquarters. But that was on my terms. And I was having a drink with my friends at a place I liked. You couldn't understand someone not having a drink when it was offered to him by a rich guy in Westport. But he took the news gamely enough. He directed me to his house, parked the car in the big driveway, and we walked inside. The house was all dark. It was 1.30 by this time. We'd beaten the train from Grand Central. Not by much, but we'd gotten there before the train. I didn't know how he would have gotten from the train station to his house. If he had a car parked at the train station in Westport, or if he would have taken a taxi. Didn't ask about that. He poured out a drink for himself. That was the first thing he did. Ice, vodka on the rocks. Got his checkbook. Made me out a check for $150. He was showing me pictures of his sailboat, then of his children, then of his wife. The things that matter to him. But first, the sailboat. He said, man, I wish I could show it to you in good weather. I wish it was five in the afternoon on a summer day right now. We could go out for a sail. I said, yeah, that'd be lovely. But it's not, is it? It's almost Christmas. He said, yeah, it is. I think I drank too much at that party. But then I always do. I get carried away. I get enthusiastic. I'd had a good week. I'd made some good deals, you know. Drank too much. All of a sudden, he seemed to have regrets, maybe major regrets. And I wanted to get the hell out of that house and on my way back to New York with this fat check that might or might not bounce before he started delving into his major regrets because I had a feeling that might go on for a while. So I took the check, I shook his hand, 
He let me out of the house. I got in the taxi and I started back. It took me only about half an hour to get back. I went to my favorite bar, Puffy's, down on Hudson Street in Tribeca. Had a drink there. I told Jim, the barman, about my guy to Westport and how if that check did not bounce, I would set a record for my best yielding 12 hours of cab driving, my best shift ever. If I made that 150 on top of what I'd made before, on top of paying the lease fee and on top of paying the gas and all that, I would have made maybe all in all total 225 or something for myself. A great night and a record for me personally. Jim was happy for me. He was happy for himself. He knew I'd probably give him a bigger tip that night than I usually did. As I did, because it was my lucky night. I went back to the fleet. I told my friend Jimmy, who tied up the same time I did, about my good luck. And he said, yeah, you call it good luck. You wait and see if that check clears. Because he and I were always in competition to see who could set the record for the best shift of driving. He'd been ahead for a while. With this spectacular yield, I would have topped him by a good amount. So he would have felt that I was further out of reach, my record. He didn't like that, but we enjoyed the competition, the banter. I said, well, I'll take it to the bank tomorrow. We'll see if it clears. I'll know in a few days. The check did clear, and I had the record, for a while anyway, till Jimmy got his Japanese guy in the taxi, whose wife threw up, and then the Japanese guy gave him a huge tip in yen. But that was another story. Another story entirely. Thank mm-hmm. you.